Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, July 14, 21st, sorry, July 21st. We are coming toward the end of our study of the Gospel in the Stars. It's been a rich study. Just as a quick overview for those coming in for a first time, we saw back in Bereshit, in Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 and 6, that God took Abraham out, showed him the stars, and it says that Abraham believed and it was counted for righteousness. Now, on the surface, he was told that as the, the stars that he sees, so would his seed be, meaning descendant, seed, S-E-E-D. And most stop right there, and they say Avram was promised to be a big family. But I'll ask you the question, when does believing that you're going to be a big family get you a righteous standing with God? And obviously the answer is it doesn't. That's not what God was referring to in depth, in a totality. He is referring to the seed that would come from Abraham, that seed being Mashiach, Messiah, that he would come in human form. He, Abraham saw his day, as Shaul, Paul put it in the book of Romans, looking down through the corridors as time was laid out through those stars, he saw that, and he believed in the coming of Messiah to be the sacrifice lamb of God who could take away the sin of the world. That's what got him his status of righteous with God. That's what he put his faith in. We do know and agree, and Genesis 22 backs it up, that God also promised him the big uh, family, the progeny, and that too, of course, uh, we see that to this day. When we see that there was something in the stars, we see in Genesis 15, God told Abraham, count the stars. That's your English, but the Hebrew was narrate tell declare if you can that declare word i my antenna goes up because the word the same hebrew word translated count in genesis 15 in psalm 19 was translated declare that verse psalm 19 one says the heavens declare the glory of god when you get down through the first four verses you have that the day and night the night's uttering speech the day is declaring the glory of god also and you have to ask yourself, what speech is there in the night? Well, if the stars are declaring, if they're telling, if they're narrating, this could be their speech. When we take that to Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1 verse 3 tells us that the glory of God is Yeshua, Jesus. So now we have the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens are declaring Yeshua. That fits with what we said about Genesis 15. Now, Abraham saw Yeshua's day. Jesus is Yeshua in English, Yeshua the Hebrew. Abraham saw that day, believed in it, and it was counted to him for righteousness. In that, we went into the view and the look and discovered, well, we didn't discover, but others before us, that there is a, an astronomy not astrology, and I'll emphasize that every class, have nothing to do with astrology. All Satan, Satan can do is counterfeit, and all that you read of astrology, horoscopes, your signs, and all of that, throw it out, yes. bury it, don't have anything to do with it, don't take a peek at it, that's not what we're studying. But we're studying the truth, the true, the astronomy of God that told the story. We don't have it all today, but we have a good lot of it left. We got it through the passing down of the ancient languages that tells the names of the stars. And when we know what those names mean, it helps us to understand and put together what that sign was a picture of. We know that this was probably declared very clearly back before there was a written word. When the, the shepherds would lay in the open fields at night, they're passing down to their children, we know the, the genealogical line, but we also believe that they were looking up and as the sky changes, the stars you see tonight are not the stars you'll see during the winter, that as that was passed down, they were able to teach their children the whole plan of God that we see in the stars. We know that Daniel, Daniel went into captivity in Babylon he was wiser than their wise men. He was able to, to interpret the dreams by the power of God, but we know that he had great wisdom. We believe that he passed that wisdom to the wise men. They should have been very interested in his wisdom because his wisdom and his uh, the connection with the one true living, God spared their lives. They were on the, the, the docket or whatever to have their heads chopped off. They came to get Daniel to put him to death because that was a decree because no one 
could tell the king Nebuchadnezzar's dream. God revealed that dream to Daniel, spared their lives. I'm sure that they felt that there was value in what he had to share. That being passed down would be where the wise men who came from the east to see the babe when he was born, Yeshua Jesus, where they got that knowledge. They told Herod, we have seen his star and we've come to worship him. They had asked the question, where is he born king of the Jews? Well, how did these wise men in the east know that the king of the Jews was to be born and that that time had happened and obviously it was at the right time because they do come and see the young child, which means it was not when he was still in the stable, that immediate, you know, he wasn't a day or two old, but he was under two years of age. It took them time to travel. They did know that the babe had been born. They did come to worship him. How did they know? Well, if Daniel passed to them the gospel and the stars, the same as Abraham passed down to his, who passed down, who passed down, then we can see and we know that we're on to something that is true. We've been very, very careful to stay away from anything that, that smacks of the astrology because, again, we don't want the counterfeit. We only want the real. As we went through the signs, we started with Virgo, the virgin who did conceive and brings forth the male child who we know to be Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. We've gone through, on, oh, and by the way, we study the 12 constellations on the elliptical path that the sun is on. And uh, those give us each one for each month. That's the only relation that you'll see in our talking that, that, that brings you to what could be astrology. Again, Satan takes a bit of the truth, the spoonful of sugar, to get the medicine to go down. So yes, we do look at those names. Virgo, um, I don't remember what comes next. Recent spin, Sagittarius and Gemini. And uh, we're going to be in Cancer probably today. Those main names, we still look at those, and then we look at the little constellations that fall under them to put together our story. But we see that even those names, there's a meaning to them. So um, rather than go through each one of them, stay tuned with me. If we finish next week, we'll go through a quick review of each of those 12 major. Each major one had three under it. So by the time we finish our study, we'll study 48 of these constellations, 12 major. 36 minor. I will not review all the 36 minor at that end. I'll just give you the, the main point of the 12 that tell the story of our Messiah and Savior, his first coming. That's our first book. Remember, we divided it into three books. The first book is his first coming to suffer and die for us. The second book is who he did that for, the redeemed. And the third book that we're in now is uh, the, the second coming, coming back to receive his possession, the redeemed that he, um, he, that he died for. In each of those three books, we have four chapters, and those four chapters correlate to the four signs. So as we review, um, and we're coming into Gemini Taurus, as we reviewed last week's lesson, we were in the sign of Taurus, the bull. We saw that bull was as big as an elephant that he had his horns down and he's headed rushing to take out the enemy. That's the second coming of the Lord who will annihilate the enemy with his coming. We looked at the, uh, and it's called a decon or a constellation that's under Taurus. We looked at Aradnus. That was the one that the serpentine course that's going down, down, down. And by the way, if you look at your chart, here's my chart. Aradnus is when you have the chart like this. And, and Yvonne, I, I'll um, get together with you to email you what I'm talking about later. But down at the bottom of the chart, you see Aradnus. I may be pronouncing this very wrong. Roger's pulling it up if you can see my screen. Um, he's going back to a few to, to pull it up and show. There it is. Okay. And that going down it is a river of fire. It's leading to the lake of fire. We saw that even Cetus, the sea monster, which is on the, the, my right on your, your left, I guess. Yeah, that guy. Um, that was the picture of Satan, that, that even Cetus cannot stop this river of fire. He, he, he's not in control. He's going to also be cast into the lake of fire. Last week, also, we looked at Auriga. Auriga is a shepherd, and the shepherd, um, I think he's, he is just 
almost off the screen on my left, so it'll be your right, uh, right by the number 10, okay, on, on this side of the number on 10. The yeah, there you go, yeah. that's Auriga. That's the shepherd. It's showing that, that um, there's safety in the, for the redeemed in the day of wrath, when this wrath, that the, the lake of fire, the river of fire and lake of fire is showing that the redeemed are kept safe. This answered Malachi, 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 however you say it, Malachi um, chapter three, um, I think either three or four, one of the ch chapter three says, who may abide the day of his coming? Well, the ones who are able to abide are the ones that are safe in the fold. We see him as a shepherd, the sheep are his people. Auriga was sitting on the Milky Way, holding on to that goat that is clinging to him because he's fearful of the, the horns of the bull. Notice though, Auriga's foot is stopping the, the horn. Remember though, I mean, I say it's stopping it. It's not going to hurt the, the goat and the little sheep that he have with him also. Uh, but when we know Taurus is a picture of the second coming of the Lord, nothing's going to stop him from taking out the enemy then. What chapter was that? Uh, Malachi, oh, three, verse two. Okay. okay, in his right hand he has a band uh, that if you see it as a band, then what you are seeing is that he is binding the enemy with it, or he will bind the enemy, that seed is the sea monster with it, and on the other side he is uh, upholding and guiding his people. So he keeps his people from um, the, the enemy. If you see it as a fishing net, and it can be either one, because remember our pictures are not inerrant. The word of God is inerrant, but our pictures are not. They're just to help us understand, and sometimes we wonder how did they ever get the picture? Well, they brought it together by studying the names of the stars, and then they got meaning from it. So, like I say, that part's man-made. It's not um, inerrant, but it gives us a good idea and a good understanding. So if it is a fishing net, it is the one, our Savior who is casting out to, um, remember he even said to his Talmudim, his disciples, I will make you fishers of men. So he's fishing for the souls of men, okay? Now, as shepherd we saw last week in detail, so today only highlight, he is the good shepherd. That's Yochanan John, chapter 10, verse 11, talks about how the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's a picture of Messiah's crucifixion. We saw in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20 that he's referred to as a great shepherd and in the reference in Hebrews 13, 20, we see his resurrection, that the, the one who laid down his life resurrected from the dead that he might give us abundant life. Then we also saw from 1 Kepha, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, that the chief shepherd would be coming in glory. So this would be his second coming to rule and to reign. Not like the, like the first coming when he came humble and as a servant and suffered and died, but now he will come in all his glory. So even in the shepherd we see the first coming, who he came for, and the second coming, the return. So it is a beautiful, beautiful picture. That concluded the first chapter of the third book. We saw again in just overview, Taurus, saw, we saw from Taurus the power of his coming. We saw Orion in there showing us the splendor of his coming, the brightness and the light that we talked about. We saw in Aradnus the fiery judgment of his coming. And we saw in Ariga the protection of his own at his coming. That brought us into Gemini or Gemini, whichever way you pronounce it, that would be number 10 on your chart, it's very close to um, the, the serpent that was that we saw around us. Number 10 is down at the bottom on your charts. And Gemini, Gemini, the twins, we saw that they were united, that they're a couple. We saw from scripture, Shemot, the book of Exodus, the building of the tabernacle. It talked about the, the way that the wood was, ta was um, united, coupled together. It's solid, it can't be broken. And that also shows us our, our Jehovah God, the Father, and Yeshua, the Son. We can see in Gemini, it could be their throne, because remember the Son sitting on the right hand of the Father. So this could be a picture of God the Father and God the Son. We also saw we could see it as a picture, again, of the dual nature of our Savior, our Messiah, that he is 100% fully God 
and he is 100% fully human when he came, you know, to this earth for us. And we saw that from what's in their hands, the club that, that he is taking out the enemy, the bow, that's the second coming. The first coming would be the bow that, that there is no arrow because the arrow's already been shot. We know that that arrow was what uh, pierced Messiah on the cross, his crucifixion. But we know the bow hung in space because the work has been done is the rainbow, the redemption uh, bow for us, redemptive arch in never-ending blessings of wonder, R-A-I-M-B-O-W. So whichever way you look at it, either way, or a final way to look at it also is to see it as um, a groom and his bride. Some see a man and a woman in it, and if so, that would be that we are the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Messiah, that it would be a picture of him being our bridegroom. This would be Revelation 19 leading into 20. He comes back, stops the battle of Armageddon, and he sets up his kingdom. Um, actually, well, the marriage supper of the Lamb is, is in chapter 20. That's what I was getting at. The marriage took place in heaven. He comes down to earth, and we have the... Um, the feast, the, the marriage feast, okay? Um, also, by the way, the club showing um, Messiah in his second coming will rule with a rod of iron. We saw that in Tehillim Psalm chapter 2 and other uh, places, Revelation 5, other places also. Again, this is just the overview. We're going to pick up where we left off now. Last week, we're under the main sign is Gemini, and we're going to look at the different decons that are under Gemini. Uh, I think we just barely started last week, and if this helps you today, Pam, this is where we're starting right now, if that helps you for today, okay? All right, so we're, the first one we look at is Lepus, and that's right down where we've been looking. Uh, go, have, go to the, yeah, go straight down out of where Radnus is. Keep going. Okay, there you go. Yeah, it almost looks like an F there. Maybe that's my eyeballs going. It's a P. L E P U S. Lepus. Okay, so Lepus, again, I think we started talking about it last week, but I'm just going to pick up as if we didn't. I will tell you that that's the name in Latin. Um, I like the picture on the right in the sense it looks a little more like a hare, a rabbit, H-A-R-E, that's what it's supposed to look like, <laughs> okay? It is a picture of the enemy. Now there's 19 stars that make up this constellation, and it's the enemy being trodden underfoot. Notice who's above him is Orion, and Orion is, is trampling him underfoot. It's hard to see, but that is what is supposed to be taking um, effect. Now. We don't see Lepus being put to death. He's being held down, he's being bound, but he's not being put to death. That would be a picture, when we know he's our enemy, we know it's a picture of Satan, Satan. When is he bound, when is he held down, but not gone, not powerless yet? That's during the millennial reign. We know that the angel comes down from heaven, takes Satan and, and chains him in the bottomless pit for the thousand year reign of Messiah. That's why there's shalom, peace on the face of this earth during the thousand years, is because he is bound. That's what the part that this is a picture of. We're going to see another part where he's cast into the lake of fire. But right now, this is just showing that he is powerless until um, till the millennial reign is over. So the Revelation. Rabbit's bad. The rabbit's bad. The rabbit's bad. The rabbit's picture Satan, yes, Satan. Revelation 20 and verse 2 is where I, I refer to the angel binding Satan in the bottomless pit during the millennium. That's Revelation 20 and verse 2. Now, it is supposed to be a gigantic hair because Satan is big. He is a big enemy. He is a powerful enemy. He is the prince of the power of the air today. We know that. But the stars in his body tell us that, that he is the enemy of him that comes. That's Messiah who comes. But the other names, and the other names are the caught, the bound, and the deceiver. So who is our deceiver? Satan. We know that. We know that, that that's the name given for him is, uh, or uh, that we're told he comes to deceive. We know he sends out deception to get people to follow him. Um, again, though, he's under Orion's foot. See the foot? Now I think Roger's got it where it's showing better. It's about ready to come down on his head. 
When it does come down on his head, that will be the death blow. That will be the final crush. Remember Genesis 3.15, our first prophecy, which we've seen time and again through the gospel and the stars, that the enemy would crush Messiah's heel. That's the place his humanness touched this earth. That's a picture of the crucifixion. But he would crush the head. If you crush the head, it's dead. It doesn't come back. And that's what we will be seeing. But right now he's under Orion because Orion was a picture of our Messiah, of our Savior. And we are going to see his power um, overrule Satan forever. Um, again, he's giving him a little rope to hang himself, shall I say, right now. But that's all part of God's plan and we know that. I want to read to you from the prophet Yeshia, Isaiah. It's Isaiah chapter 63, and I'm going to read you verses 3 and 4. Um, the first verses we know that it is the Messiah coming and the second coming. He's coming to Bozrah, which is part of the scene of Armageddon. He's coming in garments that show how glorious he is, but they're also stained in red because he's trampling out the winepress in his wrath. That's the blood of, of those that is being shed. Then verse th uh, 3 of chapter 63 says, and it's the Lord speaking, I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no one with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my clothes, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. Remember how we know the cup of wrath, the cup of God's indignation towards sin is coming to a full. When it is to that full, it will be poured out in tribulation on the face of this earth. God is bringing wrath and justice in judgment against a sinful world. And then he comes back at the end and annihilates the enemy. That's the blood that he's just talked about that's staining him. But this is his day of redemption, when he will redeem his people who have been persecuted. We see that all through time, but especially during the period of the tribulation, the martyrdom of the saints is going to be horrendous. It's going to be, it's a multitude that can't even be numbered, we're told in the book of Revelation. Notice also in Tehillim, in Psalm chapter 60 and verse 12, Psalm chapter 60 and verse 12 we read through God we will do valiantly it is he who will trample down our enemies and I remind us of that we don't have to defeat our enemies we have to in the power of the Lord allow the Lord to defeat our enemies for us if we're trying to get rid of our enemies on our own we're going to wear ourselves out and we're going to eventually fall but if we turn to the Lord and allow him to work through us, he will put your enemies under his feet. He will trample them down for you. And eventually we will have the 100% trampling down of the enemy of us also, who is Satan. He won't ever be able to bother us again. Yay! <laughs> Clap, yay, hallelujah, yeah, you can say it. Again, Malachi, Malachi chapter 4, the, the first few years of first few verses in there are talking again about the returning of the Lord and well here let me just read you verse 3 Malachi um, verse 4 chapter 4 sorry chapter 4 and verse 3 and we read there and you will crush the wicked underfoot for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I am preparing says the Lord of armies the Lord of hosts Adonai Salvaot so he's telling us, yes, because we come back with him, we are his armies fighting with him, but it, it, obviously he is the lead. He is the one who really crushes our enemies. The significance of the sign of Lepus is that he will be overthrown. The enemy of the Lord will be overthrown in the day of the Lord's return. Just to back up my point, because if I am saying it, I want you to know I get it from Scripture. Otherwise, don't listen to me. Revelation 19, verse 11, I saw heaven open, and, a, and behold, pay attention, behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, 
and in righteousness he judges and wages war. That can only be a description of Messiah. No one else. So heaven's open, the white horse, the one coming out on the white horse is coming out to judge, to wage war. And verse, what do I want? 15 probably. Yes, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the wine press of the, wine press of the fierce wrath of, the, of God the Almighty. This is when he comes, that sword out of his mouth, stops the Antichrist, annihilates him on the spot. He is out and all the enemy that is with him. Hallelujah. That's is, is the horse on there? No, the horse is not on there. That's just what we read in Revelation 19. Okay. Now we're going to enter into Canis Major. That's our next decon. And that, for those of you who don't have the papers I've given out before, C-A-N-I-S. It looks like can is, okay, Canis. In Hebrew it's a ab, and it means wolf, or it means dog. Or another name given to this also is Sirius. S-I-R, sir, okay, I-U-S, Sirius. And that means the prince. Well, if we stick with the prince for a moment, since I'm at Revelation 19, I read verse 16. On his robe, the one who, who we just described coming, on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. This is who our Messiah is. We know another description given to him is, and this is Isaiah 9.6, uh, yeah, 9.6, is Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. Sar, you can hear how Sirius is an offshoot from the word Sar in Hebrew. So that's how some get it when they name it Sirius, that they call him the prince. Now, you know this, um, this decon, you don't know all the stars that make the dog, but if we take away a few of them, you'll suddenly realize you're looking at the Big Dipper. So this is a familiar one to us. We're going to study next Canis Minor, Roger's already got it keyed up in the, the screen showing the, the names. There you go. That, that's our little dipper. Or a big dog and a little dog. Or a bigger prince and a smaller prince if we're going by that name. But th this ends up being very, very interesting. I, I love some of the, the pictures we get out of here. It has 64 stars in it. When we look at the big dipper, we're looking at seven stars. The, the whole constellation itself has 64 stars, and this dog or this wolf is the special hunter and the devourer of Lepus, of the hare. This is the enemy of the hare. So we know, again, it's a picture of the Lord, because who is going to wipe out Satan? Certainly not us, but the Lord is going to take him out. Hebrew, again, the name means the wolf. Now, in, the, in his head, the star that's the brightest, it, it is literally the most fiery, bright, fiery star in all of the heavens. Okay? We have our brightest. Now, those of you who have been with me in the study, we've seen some pretty amazing bright stars that have confounded our mind, and we've hardly been able to, to hold on to it. Well, are you ready for this? <laughs> Let me tell you about this. The star called Sirius. S-I-R-I-U-S, is actually a two-star system. That means it's two stars that are so close, it appears to be one. They call them Sir A and Sir B, okay, just to, to help us understand. The force of gravity on B, because of A, is 350,000 times stronger than Earth's gravity. Now, let me put that into something to help us understand. Y'all remember the sugar cube? That little tiny sugar cube? If it was in that gravity, that pull on it, it would weigh 2,200 pounds, one sugar cube. <laughs> that's a lot of density. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of gravity. That's a lot of weight. Sir A. So stronger in gravity? Yes, yes, gravity. yes, yeah. Sir, Sir A, okay, the, the one that's affecting B like that, <clears throat> it is 71% larger than our sun. Okay, we know our sun is big, it's 71% larger. Its radius is 740,000 miles. Hmm. 
Anybody wrap their brain around that one? No. I love this. I love when God says, let me just blow your mind. You see a little twinkle, twinkle, little star. They take that word little out. There's nothing little about this star, okay? B only has a radius of 3,650 miles. That's all. It's a smaller one. It's slightly smaller than our Earth, okay? A, Sir A, is twice the mass of the sun. B is about the same mass as the sun, but that means that B is this very dense object. The temperature of A would be probably somewhere around 18,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You think you're hot today, folks? <laughs> you wouldn't survive anywhere near Sir A. Um, and it's almost twice as hot as our sun is Sir A. B, because of that density, B is almost five times hotter than our sun. Does that mean that it's further away from us than the sun? Yes, yes. If it were any closer, <laughs> goodbye. Sunburn, no worry. Crispy critter, no <laughs> word. Ashes, maybe. <laughs> so Venus was five times hotter. Um, not Venus, Sir B. Sir B. Sir B. Sir B. This series is made up of A and B. It's actually two stars, but they're so close they look like one. And A is the bigger, but it, it what its pull does on B is make B very dense. So A is much larger. B is more dense. A is all that I was telling you, so much bigger than the sun, the radius 740,000 miles, is 18,000 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, and yet B, that little one that's, you know, the sugar cube that would weigh over, over two tons, that B is also five times hotter than our sun. That's just amazing. That's just the star in the head. There, Roger's got it. There we go. Almost looks like it's in the neck there, and that can be. Remember, we're not exacting on our pictures. But anyway, that star, that star is called Sirius. We now have an idea, and that is the brightest, most fiery star in all the heavens that we, to this day, have knowledge this is of. this a star that's five times harder than the sun. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mind blowing. Okay. Now, remember, I told you, Yeshaya, Isaiah nine six is where we have him called the Prince Sir or Sar. I'm sorry, Sar in Hebrew. That Sirius comes off of that. The Prince of Peace. Egyptian is Seer. Hebrew is Sar. So you can see the the relation, you know, in in the words. When you break down the words from their ancient languages and get into the roots, they mean the same thing. They're all meaning the prince. Let me bring to you, because of how bright this star is, let me bring to you what came to my mind, and that is Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, our last chapter in the Bible. And this is, well, it tells us right from the start who's speaking. I, Yeshua, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, of David. I am the bright morning star. Oh, yeah, he's bright. And this star is this bright. And it's the fire in all of our heavens. And we know the Lord's going to outshine everything. That everyone, the whole earth is going to see his glorious coming. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Give me a grown-up vocabulary. He's gonna I don't have. I just sun. my mouth drops open and I just go, "Wow, God!" <laughs> yes, yeah, amazing, amazing. Now it's interesting because the ancients always referred to the time when when they would be seeing Sirius that was always associated with the great heat. How many of you remember the expression "the dog days of summer"? I've heard that during my life, and I thought it meant because the dogs lay, you know, in the heat also that it does them in. Well, we but no. no sun or moon in heaven because he'll be the light. Exactly. That's how bright he is. Yes. Yes. Um, Pam was saying we don't need a sun in heaven. We, and, and the New Jerusalem, all that, we know he is the light of it. But that expression, the dog days of summer, was relating to the dog, Sirius, this heat, that's how that expression came about. 
I thought that was interesting because I do remember hearing the dog days of summer. And I always pictured my little dog who'd love to get in the fan and just lay there. <laughs> and I think it's the dog days of summer. <laughs> but no, that's not where it came from. Okay, now, again, being the brightest star, it's speaking to us of our Prince of Peace, our Sar Shalom. Our English word, sir, does come from this. The idea behind Sirius in the language, when you break down the root, is the chief, or they'll say the chieftain. That's the head chief. The guardian, the victorious one, the star in the left forefront, the, the paw, the left paw, that one means prince or ruler. The star in his body, one of those, and I don't know which one, but one of the stars in his body means the bright, the shining, and in the right leg, hind leg, the right hind leg, it is the glorious, or I would say the glorious one. Now, if you're your minds are thinking, you think, okay, wait a minute. She called him the bright morning star, Revelation 22, 16. But I remember that Satan was also called the morning star. So how do we know which, and how can we have one associated for both? Well, we don't. Right, the morning star and then the morning star, yeah. So let's find out what our answer to that is, okay? And let me read to you because you just heard Revelation 22, 16. Hold on to it if you looked it up. You may want to read it again. But the other reference is Isaiah 14. <clears throat> Isaiah 14, Yeshua chapter 14, and verse 12. And that says, How have you fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, son of the dawn? When we studied Isaiah before, we did say that is Satan when he was cast out of heaven, when he fell, it because pride had been lifted up in him. So we know that here Satan is called a morning star, okay, the star of the morning, okay. Um, some put in the word Lucifer there in some of the translations. If you see that, don't let that bother you. And Satan's fall from heaven it is mentioned, uh, I think, let me see if this is the right reference, also in Luke. I believe it is Luke 10. Okay, Luke 10 and verse 18. <clears throat> yes. No. No, no, no. I Yes, I was reading 19. Sorry. Okay, Luke 10, 18. He said to them, I watched Satan. I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Okay, the fallen star, the fallen morning star. But Revelation 22, 16, unmistakably and clearly is... Yeshua Jesus, our Messiah, in all his glory. So, how do, how do we have this? How can this be applied to both? Well, notice in Scripture, sometimes we see a similarity, okay? If I give you Revelation 5.5, 5, you're going to remember in that, the one that was like looked like the lamb who had been slain, now looked like, do you remember what he's called in Revelation 5.5? 5, 5? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, if you can see my poster, I've got a great example. Roger's going to go over to it. Maybe too far away, though. Yeah, too far away. It's the lion and the lamb. Okay, all right. Well, just look up Revelation 5.5. 5. He is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. If you remember 1 Kepha, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, is a description of Satan. And in that description, it talks about him being a lion seeking whom he may devour. So see, sometimes in scripture, we do have a similarity, but the description is going to tell us the difference, okay? The lion that's seeking to devour you is your enemy, Satan. The lion of the tribe of Judah is the victorious king of the jungle, the ruling king wearing his crown. He's being a counterfeit again. He's being a counterfeit again, and he's flipping from the good to the evil, to the bad. Okay, now the idea of the bright morning star is that it outshines all the others. And we just talked about how Sirius outshines and how it comes from Sar, our Hebrew word for prince, who we know is referring to the Lord. Well, Satan was a morning star. He is described that way. Yeshua Jesus, in his in, in, incarnate form, in his human form, at the same time as in his godly form, this is Revelation 22, 16, where he is called the bright and morning star. But notice how he is called the bright and morning star. 
He, this defines it, makes it a definitive one. Remember, if I ask you to bring me a cup, you could bring me a coffee cup, you could bring me a crystal cup, you could bring me a plastic cup, you could bring me anything. But as soon as I define it and make it specific, bring me the cup, then it gets, you know, I'm, I'm going after a specific one. So where Satan was a morning star or a star of the morning, which means he was bright, we have a brighter one who is called the bright and morning star. He is the most holy. He has the most powerful light in the universe. His light so great that the whole world will see his coming. You can never say that about Satan. They are in no sense equal. In fact, Satan was given his light by Yeshua who created him. So it's obviously a lesser them than the one that uh, that we're referring to as the bright and morning star. Satan will only have light as long as God extends it to him. If God decides to snuff out his light, it's gone. As far as I'm concerned, when he's in the lake of fire, it's, a, it's amazing, I, and I know it for a fact, and I cannot explain it, but in fire, it, it's light and darkness at the same time. Fire is very dark. The firemen can't see without special equipment to find the people that, that are in the burning house. But at the same time, when you're in there, there is a light from the flame. I don't know how to explain it, but it gets extinguished. And that's what I see. Satan's light is going to be extinguished when he's in the lake of fire, as far as I'm concerned. I know that Yeshua Jesus is the light of the world. Let me take you to Yochanan, to John chapter 9, because I have you and Luke, you're real close. Just go over one more book to John. John chapter 9 and verse 5. And I read for you there. While I, and the Lord's the one speaking, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Yeshua came, he even said in, in Yochanan in John chapter 8 and verse 12 that he, and here I'll read that one to you also because we just go back a page. John 8 and verse 12, the very well known. Then Yeshua spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now that's a light that brings life. That's a light that comes from the Lord and he alone. Satan can't even counterfeit that. He cannot bring life. He cannot bring light to people who are in darkness. They stay in darkness. They, they love the darkness because their deeds are evil. So the comparison ends. There is no common comparison between the two other than Satan had light given to him by the Lord. He was beautiful in his uh, original creation. We know that from Isaiah 14. You can go back and read the, the description. He was bright, but only Yeshua Jesus' light is the brightest. He is the self-existing light. No one can put out his light. His light will never go out. All Satan can do is be a poor imitation. The bright and morning star belongs to Yeshua Jesus and to he alone, the light of the world, who will, as Pam said, light all of the new Jerusalem, 1,500 miles square, wide, and, and with whatever, you know, that triangular form. And we know that through all of eternity, we need no lamp. The light of our heavenly home is the glory of God, Yeshua, Jesus. So, there's your, your difference. Hopefully, I've answered your question so, before you so have the question. Yeah. So, that's the difference between the two morning stars. Yes. Yeah. It, the, the one when it refers to the star of the morning or a star of the morning, that's a less. It was a bright star. It is Satan had bright. And remember, he counterfeits. He comes disguised as an angel of light. That's another scripture. I'll have to look up the verse. Maybe somebody can catch it for me before class ends. But that's another verse. He's trying to imitate. He's trying to fake who he is. But his light dims in comparison to the bright and morning star that we read about in Revelation 22, 16. Okay. In uh, Canis Major, other stars that we cannot see defined so well, but within him uh, mean who shall come. Reminding us Messiah is coming again. This is the second coming. There's another one that says chief of the right hand. Where is Messiah now? The right hand of God. On the right hand of God. Does that title not fit him? Chief of the right hand? Um, which, you know, is, is, he's on the right hand of God. He is the chief is what I'm saying. Yeah, There's also more stars that me. I'm sorry? 
I said cheap on the right, votes on the left. Correct? Yes, in the in the judgment, yes. In judgment. Yeah. yeah. You can't apply for it nowadays, so just in judgment. Uh, well, we say we're his sheep because we're in his fold, and we will say that very clearly. But the goat that you saw Ariga holding was a goat that's safe in his arms. So, yeah, it's not the same so now. So you can't count it for today? No, the sheep and goat judgment of Matthew 25 is millennial. Who will go into the millennium? Who makes it through them? Tribulation goes into the, the millennium. The sheep go in, the goats are cast out. Okay, other names of the stars are the prince, the mighty, and the leader or the chief. So all the way around we see it. And it's interesting that the Egyptian name uh, in their zodiac, that's one of the older ones that we find, they called it Nas Seer, which means the sent prince. And we know he was sent by God for us. I find that interesting because, you know, there's a lot of similarity between the Egyptian, the Arabic, the ancient Hebrew, you know, they're, they're related languages. In our Bible, uh, and I've got to take you just a slight bit of Hebrew, not, not too much, but just a slight bit to understand fully. Go with me real quickly to Isaiah again. Yeshaya chapter 11 and verse 1. Um, and just depending on your, come on, let me back in. I typed it wrong. Okay, there we go. Depending on the version that you're reading, um, you may have slightly different language. That's why I wanted you to look it up. Um, New American says, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, Yeshi, or Kiryashai. Uh, King James says that a rod will spring from, oh no, 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 I'm sorry. It, the shoot will spring from the rod of Jesse. So we've got a stem, we've got a rod. You can have, you know, different verses, uh, different interpretations, I'm sorry, but when we get to the Hebrew, we're getting to the root of the word there. The word in Hebrew is netzer. Now, Netzer sounds very close to Nas Seir, the Egyptian to the Hebrew. Netzer is called the branch, okay? So this stem, this root of Jesse, we see it as, and I'll take you to the olive tree for good example. You can cut down an olive tree. You have a stump there. Guess what happens? A root comes up out of that stump. In time, there will be an olive tree there again. If you want to get rid of an olive tree, you have to get rid of all the root. You have to get the whole thing out and God help you if you try. They're, they're, they, they usually just cut them down. They don't try to, you know, because it'll be a long time before it's built back. But anyway, we know Messiah is called the branch. We know that we're on to something here when it's talking about the, the rod that would stem from, or the, the shoot that would spring from Jesse. Jesse, remember, is the father of David. David is the line to Yeshua, Jesus. So, he's called Netzer in Isaiah here. Netzer is the forerunner when the language is evolving. It's a forerunner for the word Nazarene. How many of you have heard Jesus called the Nazarene? You probably have heard that. There's even a whole church um, denomination that takes off from this name. Well, Netzer Green. Nazarene, which is where Nazarene comes from, the only place that we notice that in scripture is Matthew chapter 2 and verse 23. Matthew 2 and verse 23. And in Matthew 2, 23, I read, and this is the, the wise men have come in two to, to see the child. Um, verse 23, and came and settled in a city called Nazareth. Okay? That's where Joseph and Miriam, Joseph and Mary, and the baby Yeshua Jesus settled was in Nazareth. That was his boyhood town. He grew up in Nazareth. I think you're all familiar with that if you know the story of Yeshua Jesus' earthly life. Now, notice what chapter 2, verse 23 of Matthew continues to say. This happened so that what was spoken through the prophets would be fulfilled. He would be called a Nazarene. Where do we see him called a Nazarene in the prophets? The only place we get it is from this word in Isaiah 11, 1, Netzer, Netzerine, Netzerine, Netzer, the bright morning star. So we have the foreshadowing that this bright morning star, this is the, outdoes all the rest of the heavens, 
now we see that he also is called the Nazarene to fulfill the scripture that he would shoot from the stem or the rod of Jesse. We know that's prophetic of the coming Messiah to rule and reign with a rod of iron, which we saw just a bit ago. We see it in Orion also, but we saw it just a bit ago. Um, which constellation was it? I gave my notes away. Um, the one that I mentioned in our review, it'll come back to me in a minute. Anyway, I, you, you can fill in the blank for me. But uh, so really we have a great picture in Canis Major of the second coming of our Lord, the bright morning star, the one coming to rule and reign, wearing the crown of glory, and his glory filling the, the whole earth. It is amazing. That's all out of Canis Major. Next up is Canis Minor. And Canis Minor, in the Hebrew, they call it Shalem. It's a lot like Shalom, but it's Shalem. This is the second dog. This is in the, the, little dog. the little dog. Yes, this is also called the Exalted Redeemer. Okay, and uh, just as Gemini, we saw the two persons representing the two natures of Messiah. Here we have a second dog or wolf, if you want to go with a wolf, whatever you want to call it, it's okay representing the one who was slain. Now, Canis Major is showing us all his glory. So then, He's the Jesus, most glorious. Yes. The Lord is Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Both the big and the little. The little shows his first coming, the suffering, and the big one shows his second coming in glory. Yes. I need to ask why the word dog? I mean, could there be a better word being that we're, we're kind of talking about Christ? It's just the picture they kind of drew with it. You can call him a wolf, but I don't know if that gives it any better. It does to Roger, who loves wolves. <laughs> but the wolf has a, a negative connotation when you think of it being a ravenous you know, animal. Um, that's just the way that they have described it in our English, but you don't have to go by that name, because remember that those names are shapes. That's what man has put to it to try to help us understand. You can call it the Big Dipper and Little Dipper, you know, um, and see in that, you know, the I would see in that the big, you know, um, it would be to me the second coming, the reign of Messiah on earth, that he's got a big sheepfold that's the whole earth, that's his, um, and the little that he came to, to say, but he didn't come in in that major way. I don't know, I'm trying to think how to say it, but you don't have to... If you don't like dog, you can throw that part out. Not a problem. So one of the dogs is Jesus. Yes. Biggest is the Prince of Peace. Second coming. Little one is Jesus. Was In his first coming. Right. Right. Yeah. It's okay. hard to get these notes down. You know, it, it, there's a lot in it. Yeah. There's a lot to digest. But yeah, the big one's his second coming. The first, the little one is his first coming. Okay. When when he suffers on the cross for us, the. Um, Okay, I don't want to confuse you what I'm going to say. Um, the first one, he does the redeeming work. The second one, he is the triumphant coming back. Okay, if that helps. The big one is the triumphant. Yeah. Okay. The Egyptian word, if you want to go with the Egyptian word, call it sabak. How's that? <laughs> That's no better to me because it's a foreign word. But that means conquering and victorious. So even though he came in the, the humility that allowed him to be slain for our sins, yet he conquered sin and death for us. So he's the conqueror, he's the victorious one. In the neck, the Arabic name gives the idea of burdened or loaded down. Um, in our English, what we come down to basically is enduring and bearing. What I see is he endured the cross to bear the sins of the world. That's what we see in the names in this little dog who's showing his first coming, or this little Canis Minor. We'll just go with that Latin name, okay? This star in his body, the brightest one, you can pronounce the name if you want. Prokayan, Prosyant, don't ask me. I'm probably slaughtering a lot of these names because I don't know the languages. Procon. But Pro, what'd you say? Procon. Procon, okay. However, we're going to call him Pro, yeah. okay? <laughs> pro means Redeemer. So right there in his body, the main star in him is Redeemer. Let me read for you Isaiah 59, 
verses 19 and 20. Isaiah 59, verses 19 and 20. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. The sun rises in the east, sets in the west, so they're going to fear him from east to west. They're going to see his glory from east to west, for he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. You ever seen the wind behind something pushing and push a plane through the sky? We know those stories. Okay, um, do I want to read 20? Did I say I do? A redeemer will come to Zion, Zion, named for Jerusalem, named for Israel, to those in Yaakov, in Jacob, who turn from wrongdoing, declares the Lord. So the Lord is promising a redeemer will come to Israel. This is the redeemer who comes. He comes and he redeems Israel from her sin, from uh, the power of sin which brings death, and he brings her into the abundant life, the newness of life we see in the second coming, his rule and reigning on earth from Israel. And we know that, that Israel continues on in perpetuity because God said there would never be an end to Israel. Now, there's another star in Canis Minor. I guess it's probably that one in his head um, because it, it, it's showing that one mainly. Uh, the Arabic meaning, I'll sure, that comes from that is the prince or again the chief of the left hand now well, he's sitting on the right hand of the father we talked about that in the previous one the left hand on his left would be his flock who he's bringing in that's us that we would be the ones that he's prince and chief over so that makes this one the the two canis major and canis minor again we see it like we saw with Gemini. If you saw a male and a female, a bride and a groom, we said that we are the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Messiah. He is our savior. It's like coming into a marriage with him. This would be, again, we would see the Lord and his body. Who makes up the body? The believers. Okay, so it would be the coming together of the two. In Canis Minor are other stars that mean the prince or the ruler, and also when it says who completes or perfects. The work's completed, the work is perfected. Um, in the Hebrew form from this pro, this word, okay, the Hebrew form is pada, and that means ransomed, redeemed, preserved, and released. I like that. We're ransomed, we're redeemed, we're preserved, and we're released, released in our new bodies to enjoy the glory the Lord has for us. So, I would say that this constellation easily represents the redeemed people of God. That pro, however you say it, it's, it's a white star. It means it gives off the, the whiteness of the light. It is, okay, it's also two stars, like Sir A and Sir B that we just studied. Pro, kind of whatever, it's also made up of two stars seven times brighter and hotter than our sun and 1.4 times massive as the sun. So take one and a quarter of our sun and take it seven times brighter and you have pro kion. And that's not as bright as Sir A and Sir B that we just studied. But again, the brightness. Because our Lord, even in his dimmed glory, is still so bright, so amazing. Okay? Everybody follow that okay? Seven hundred times brighter than the sun. Did I say seven hundred or seven? I think seven. Seven times brighter than the sun. Is that right? Yeah, seven times. Seven. 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 Just, seven. Oh, just seven. Just seven. Yeah. Yeah. Some others are brighter. Sirius is brighter. Three hundred and fifty times stronger in gravity. <laughs> yeah. That's serious, yes. Yeah. Okay, so we saw at this point, let's see, um, I'm looking for chapter one here. Well, we began with chapter three of the third book, okay? Um, we had the second coming of the Redeemer, the glory that will follow. Now, chapter one, we saw he was coming to judge the earth. In chapter two, we saw his reign as Prince of Peace. And now in chapter three, we're going to see Messiah's redeemed possessions. Who did he redeem? And he consummates his relationship with him. He has his triumphant, um, he's, he's shown his triumphant in this. That's what we're going to see as we enter into the sign called Cancer. We're looking at number 11 on our chart now. 
We're looking at Cancer, Nabat in our Hebrew. Um, I put my chart somewhere. Commonly called the crab. Okay, just go one up from Gemini, or Gemini, just go one up. Right there, it looks like a crab. Okay, that's the one we're looking at. Number 11 on your chart. We're getting there, people. Oh <laughs> you probably thought I'd never get you there. It is, and, and we'll tell you why he put up that picture in a moment, okay? When we look at cancer, the overall meaning to cancer is Messiah's redeemed possessions. What is Messiah redeemed? Us, those who believe in him for salvation, where he is, his possessions, and in cancer, he holds us fast. That means we're held, we're protected, we're safe. It's the completion of his work in reference to the redeemed. The work is done, and the redeemed are going to be home with him. <clears throat> okay? Now, let me tell you, we don't have the original picture of cancer. We just don't. Today, it's strong like the crab. That's what we see. But the names of the, the little constellations underneath, the three that we're going to look at, the stars in them and with cancer, it doesn't agree to call it a crab. We think that it's just because of the shape that it got that name. But the most ancient zodiacs, again, when we go back to the, the most ancient pictures that we can find, remember when I showed you the hieroglyphics you know, on the walls? When we go back to those ancient pictures, we're looking at an Egyptian zodiac that's one of the oldest. They, they date it to 2780 BC. And in that, it is a sacred beetle. Now, if you look at the beetle and you look at the crab, you can see how it, it, the, there's a similarity. So you can see why they gravitated to make it look like a crab today. But let's go back because usually the original is closer to being right. Let's go back to that Egyptian zodiac. Let's go back to that sacred beetle. And let me give you the beetle. Because the beetle, even though for me, and I'm sure to you guys, this is, you know. But the beetle is a symbol of resurrection. This, this amazed me. I learned this as I studied. The first period of the beetle's existence is passed in a dark and a drear subterranean abode. He's in the dirt. He's crawling in the dirt, okay? His senses are feeble. His power, all he can do is, is very limited. He is lowly. He, he's just not able to do much. He's compelled to eat and to live among filth. And there's no worthy purpose. He's not doing a job that we can say, well, he's got value here. All he can do is grow and wait in life for the future changes that will come. That's his earthly life. Then nature's hand finally swathes him into a chrysalis like a cocoon. Okay, this is what I didn't know. All the activity ceases. Food's no longer taken in. The avenue of his senses are closed. The functions of life are put in abeyance. It is a picture of death. It's absolutely a picture of death. The outer body ceases but the inner self continues to live and it awaits the resurrection of the body. Suddenly that swathed creature breaks forth from its chrysalis into a being which is forever left behind the, the lowly conditions that it was stuck with in its earlier life. It soars in the bright sunshine. You know how you see the beetle that can fly? This is the beetle that can fly and it goes wherever it wants. It's free in heaven. That speaks of resurrection. We see so it in the category. Is a it's a picture of the resurrection. It makes there me have to change my opinion of it. <laughs> we prefer, or I prefer, the caterpillar that becomes the butterfly because that's a whole not, lot nicer picture to look at. But this beetle is, is really the same thing. It, it goes from that lowliness, and it also is known as the dun beetle. That's what it eats. I'll leave that there, okay? The Egyptians made more about this beetle than any other creature. They used it in their jewelry. They used it as ornaments. It was the seal for their priests. It was the seal of nobility. The, the tokens of their guilds, you know, if they were into artistries or, you know, whatever work, the, the um, token of the guilds and the orders was the beetle. 
It was used in the memorials of their marriages, and finally, it was the last mark on the mummies, put on the mummies when they were dead. You know, when the, they mummified them, the last thing they would put on the mummy was a mark that, that was this beetle. Men wondered why the Egyptians were so attached to what we call a filthy, disgusting bug. <laughs> But they could trace the beetle through almost every step of its life, and they saw in it the resurrection. They saw in it from going from darkness to light, from disability to ability, from earthbound to heavenly freedom. So they used it in the, their zodiac as a picture of the resurrected life. They call this sign the folds, the resting place. And it doesn't mean like folds and clothes, it means like a sheepfold the resting place but here's the kick okay this scarab as the egyptians call it this beetle as we call it they saw it as a symbol of immortality of resurrection of transformation and of protection that's why they used it in the funeral side too in this mumminess because of it being the symbol of new life remember how the outer shell died it quit eating and everything but the inner self was still there waited that shell being broken off from it, coming out of that chrysalis and being set free. They said that the scarab was a symbol of the sun god. They believed it could stimulate the deceased heart back to life. So they thought putting a beetle on the mummy where the heart is, it could maybe bring that mummy back to life because they were believing I've life to come out of like death. <laughs> okay, now you understand why. Well, here's the final kicker. When they mummify that body, they take out all the organs except the heart. They leave the heart in the mummy. When you see a mummy there, it's, it doesn't have his kidneys and his liver and, and all that, but his heart's still there, and the ones that, that had the opportunity, you would see at the picture. I don't know that they put the real beetle there. I think they just put the picture. Probably drew it on the cloth you know, that they mummified him in. Anyway, very interesting That's because <laughs> that side, but when you see that they, that we can see the picture of resurrection, life come out of death, the same way, like I say, we prefer the caterpillar and the butterfly, and I'll stick with that, yeah, thank you very fly. much. Yeah. But Better isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah. But now let's take that into our study. Because again, that's more of the original than today what we look at and what we call the crab, which, you know, the crab, I guess, is on the bottom of the ocean and eats all the dirty stuff. <laughs> but we don't see the rest of the story. Now, the Arabic name for it gives the meaning, gives who holds or who binds or who binds together. And that's how we get the Latin, because the Latin actually is K H A N. That's when we do can, C-A-N, in Latin is K-H-A-N, and CER, C-E-R. That's the two words put together that give us cancer in English. But in the Latin, the meaning is con, K-H-A-N, that first part of the word, means the traveler's resting place. Okay, again, I see a, a sheepfold, a place to rest. Think of the truck stops on the road when the truckers are driving. That it's, it used to be called a traveler's resting place, a place to stop, refresh yourself. It was to be a safe place. And the cur, we call it sir, because we say can sir, but K-E-R in our, in our Latin, the can conquer in the Latin, can sir in the English, the cur meant encircling. So it encircled, okay? That meant that it was a place of safety because it was all contained, it was safe. It was a resting place, rest secure. Hebrew, nava means again the fold, not like a fold of clothes, but it means a pleasant place. A, a, a place we call our home the fold, okay? Now, in Parsi, in Hindu, yeah, that's it there. It's, it's harder to see it in there. But that's, you know, remember our pictures are just to help us understand. In Parsi, in Hindu, and in Chinese zodiacs, and they also believe in the Chaldean, um, they believe that's what they're seeing, the Chaldean um, zodiacs, 
they see what lended itself to be more of what's called the crap today. And they think that's how it morphed down to being the crap today. But originally, if they had held to it, we would have been calling it the scarab or the beetle or something like that. We do see legs with those stars on opposite sides. We see the two powerful claws. So we can see why it's called cancer or crap. And the claws are, are where the stars are talking about holding or, or binding. And I guess if you get caught in a cancer's claw, you know you're caught. You can't get your finger out easy, it hurts. That's binding and that's holding. 83 stars make up cancer. In the center, <laughs> I love this. This is my God again. In the center, and you see it on the picture he's got up there right now. Again, how on earth do you pronounce that word? Precipi, pre present? I don't know. Okay, P-R-A-E-S-E-P-E. -E -E. However you call that, I'm going to give it the easy name of the English name, what we call it today. We call it the beehive. Okay, I can pronounce beehive. So I'm talking about precipi or however I'm supposed to say that, but that's called the beehive. That is a cluster of stars that are so bright, they say that we can see it with our naked eye when we look at the sky. If Cancer's the sign above us and we're seeing the stars at night, obviously this would not be in the city, this would be where you can see stars. We could see this cluster because they're so bright. That cluster alone, it's made up of 50 stars. Remember, Cancer has 83 in it. 50 of them are right there in that cluster. And that cluster of stars is three times the size of our moon. So the next time you see a full moon, think of three times the size of that moon. And that's just the cluster of stars in the middle of this crab or this beetle. Again, do you see how big our God is? Do you see, I mean, oh my goodness. You know, John, uh, John Apkenberg, he's teaching all the stars right now. Oh, okay. And he was saying that the, one of the stars has, it's called the gas giant, which causes cancer. I don't know, uh, that's one of the stars that, that has all that gas, the gas giant. A lot of them have, so I don't know which one he's referring to. You know, which one you're, that causes yeah. the yeah. cancer part. And then he also said the Milky Way is still giving birth to stars right now. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, wow, that was shocking. Yeah. And then he threw out those five billion trillion stars now in the sky. And the slow rotation means longer days and longer nights. So when, you're, when the, they have the rotation around the stars, I guess. And then uh, and they, they said that the, one of the reasons why, I guess, that God took so long into creating man is because all these stars, you know, they had, they were small ones and big ones, and some had metal in them, and the gas, and it took time for the gas to all melt down or settle down or whatever. And it, that's why it took so long for him to create that man. Well, how long did it take him to create now? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I just took some notes on it there. He says that Jupiter, Saturn, and Neutron are planets that protect the Earth. So those are the ones that protect okay. us. Okay. Anyway, but he's doing a study. He did the study on the Star Sunday. Oh, okay. So I took notes yeah. of some of that. And I guarantee Since you. Since I couldn't be here this last Wednesday. Right. Yeah. And we can start. But I guarantee you, if you go into a study of the stars, you will see I've given you a synopsis you will see that there's much more. I, if I want to bring it all to you, if I even try to bring it all, some of it is just so mind-boggling. But still, I mean, look how long it took us to get to number 11. I didn't think you wanted a two-year study of it. Yeah. So yes, yeah, absolutely, could, he could be bringing out different things. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's like the Word of God. You take a verse and you've seen it from this angle and you appreciate it and there's depth in that and there's, you know, it's come alive and then something has happened to give you a view from this angle and then you get it from this angle, like the diamond. You know, the many faceted diamond, you see all the colors come out of the diamond. Each one is beautiful. Each one, if you feast on it and take it and look at it, how much you learn. So, yeah, it, it's an endless study, really. This beehive, though, uh, again, um, I'm reminded of Bereshit of Genesis 22 and verse 17. Indeed, I will greatly bless you 
will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of its enemies. Well, when you remember that this is the, like the sheepfold, and we know the shepherd's protecting his sheepfold, then this is, um, um, how did it say it? The possessing the gate of the enemies. This little cluster is protecting the sheepfold, you could say, in essence, in a way, you could say that. And again, the multitude of stars and Avraham, how many have, has he produced as the stars of the heavens and the sand on the shore? Amazing. So we see that, you know, fulfillment in God's word too. The brightest star in what would be the tail, which I guess that's the backside from where the, the claws are, means the holding. In the lower large claw, it means the sheltering or the hiding place. Anyone remember one of our favorite songs? To Helene, Psalm 91, very often quoted when we're talking about needing a place of refuge. Psalm 91 and verse 1 alone says, One who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will lodge in the shadow of the Almighty. Do you see the traveler's rest? He'll lodge there. He'll rest there. He'll rest in this one. fold that cancer is representing. And yes, it's one of our most... about how disease will not become they'll be all around us but they won't, yeah, they won't he's, take us out. he's she's remembering all the rest of Psalm 91 yeah, yes 91 1 through 11 I believe yeah well yeah. just keep reading read Psalms the whole 91. read Psalm 91 and be blessed yeah it's uh, 1 through 11 it's really good yeah I'm going to stop with verse 2 because of our time today but that says I will say to the Lord my refuge my fortress my God in whom I trust our refuge, our home, our fold, our place of safety, the traveler's rest. We are pilgrims traveling through. But when we're home, we're safe in the abode of our Lord. He's encircled us and he has granted us his safety. Another star in it does mean the assembled thousands. And through all time, all the people who have come to believe who are kept safe in the fold are thousands and more, thankfully. And then there's another name that means the kids or the lambs, that reminds us again, he's the good shepherd, but that's why I say I see the sheepfold, because the kids are the little goats, the lambs, the little the little sheep, he's our good shepherd. Um, those claws holding, or if you look at that that inner, by that, that sacred beetle, if you looked at the inner that, that held on to, you know, it, when, the, when it went through the chrysalis, the changing, that would be a symbolizing his redeemed held fast. That even if our shell, our outer, goes through death, we're not separated from our God. Our spirit goes immediately to be with our God. We are held fast. He has redeemed us. His redemption is once and for all. When you've asked the Lord into your heart for forgiveness of sin, to be your redeemer, to be your savior, he is from that point forward and never ends. You don't have to ask again and again and again. He is yours and you are his. You may need to tell him you're sorry for being disobedient, but he is still your redeemer. You are still saved by him. Now, just the same way that we saw that beetle undergo all those changes, throw off its old shell, take on a new one that let it soar, those that we call the body of Christ today, those who are making up the, the assembly, the called out that are uh, in right relation with the Lord, we should be being renewed. We should be putting on the new continually because we're now in his image. First Corinthians 517. Let me make sure. Let me make sure. Uh, I think it's first Corinthians 517. If it's not, I'll tell you in a moment. Okay, it's not. Let's see if it's 2 Corinthians 5.17. Um, it wasn't 7, was it? I'm rusty. Nope, it's not 7. That's Passover. I know that one. Okay, let's go 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is a verse y'all know. There we go. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in Messiah, this person is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. That's your scarab. 
That's your beetle. The old is gone and the new is what we put on. Romans 8, 29. 8, 28 tells us the Lord is working all things together for our good. That means even when those bad things happen, he's working them for our good. It's a whole picture put together. It doesn't mean everything that happens to you is good. No, he will work it for good in your life. And in, in verse 29, it tells us to be conformed to his image. We are supposed to be going from glory to glory, becoming more like him, more glorified, more in his image as we go along. If you look up 2 Corinthians 5 with me, then just go back one chapter. We're going to go to chapter 4 and verse 16. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outer person is decaying, our inner person is being renewed day by day. That scarab is a perfect picture of that. I hand it off to the ancient um, descriptions. I think it is one better. Lastly, look with me at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10 we read, And have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created it. So the new becomes more like its creator. Who is our creator? God the Father. God the Son with the Father, because remember we saw in the beginning, God the Father and God the Son both were involved in the creation and the Spirit of God moved over the face of the earth. We have our triunity of our God involved in our creation, and we should be being conformed more and more to his image. So, those of you who didn't like the sign cancer because of the word cancer, now you got something positive to go with it. Um, sometimes in the ancient... Um, the names in the ancient zodiacs, they that what we call the beehive because of so many stars and so much activity there, they sometimes call it the two donkeys or the two asses, asses, I can't even say it, um, Acelius Borealis and Acelius Australis, which has nothing to do with Australia, sorry, <laughs> but it's just simply meaning um, the, the northern and the southern. Anyway, when it's given those names, that have to do with the asses as in donkeys. That reminds us of the tribe called Yitzchakar, Yitzchakar for, for you in your English. That was the sign given to the tribe of, of um, you know, the 12 tribes of Jacob, Genesis 49, when he's describing the future for his children. Yitzchakar, their sign is those two donkeys or those um, asses. Um, let me read you because, again, here's where you have to know the background of the Hebrew. In Genesis um, chapter 49, we're going to look just real quickly at um, verses 14 and the start of 15. Okay, Again, 49, the whole thing is prophetic. Jacob is about to die, and he's prophesying over his children what they are going to do or become like, you know, more than just that son, but the progeny that would go on from them. For Issachar, in 14 it says he's a strong donkey. So in New American it uses the word donkey. Now notice, lying down between the sheepfolds. Here's your sheepfold again. It's interesting to see it's put together. And when is he lying down the sheepfolds? When he saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant. That's when he bowed down his shoulder to carry burdens and it goes on because of what he would do on earth. But so Issachar could be pictured by cancer, by the beehive there, it, when they look at it and say it's two donkeys there. Um, but interesting that it says lying down between the sheepfolds, and here we have in cancer, the, the real picture is supposed to be the sheepfold, the place of safety. Um, you may have the word burden instead. And cancer is the sheepfold. The sheepfold. Yes. That's cancer. That's cancer, so, yes. And that's good. Yes. That's yeah. good. The sheep are safe in the fold. The shepherd's at the gate, you know, and he lays down in front of the gate to keep them safe. Okay, also interesting when we look at Issachar, Issachar, we're looking at now, whoops, we're going to go to Deuteronomy, Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 33, and this is verses 18 and 19, Deuteronomy 33 verses 18 and 19 and we read there of Zebulon he said rejoice Zebulon in your going out okay Zebulon is a brother of Issachar 
the next, so rejoice Zebulon, and then in essence rejoice Issachar in your tents. Okay, rejoice in your tents. That's a picture of rest. That's a picture of security. They're safe at home. That's showing Israel her millennial blessings. When she's at rest with her God in the pleasant land, that's a name for Israel, is because he's ruling on his throne from Jerusalem. This is his second coming. So this would speak of the Jewish fulfillment and it could speak of the what we call the church, the called out assembly today, who are safe in the fold of Yeshua Jesus, because he has the two the two groups. We know he has how am I saying? We know that he has promises to Israel spiritually and he has promises to the church spiritually. That's what I'm trying to say. So that both um, possessing the promised possessions. We as a church are promised to be joint heirs with Yeshua Jesus so that what he falls heir to is ours also. To Israel, she has been promised the millennial land, the blessings on the land, and that she would be raised up as head nation and there would never be an end to her. And here she will dwell in safety as if all of Israel at that time is a sheepfold on earth and I could say our new Jerusalem is a sheepfold in the heavens for us. We could, we could say it both ways. Okay, now, like a holding tank. Like a holding tank, but, but nicer than that sounds. <laughs> but yes. Well, and here it says possession hold fast. Yes, he's or holding fast his answer. possessions. That means the sheep hold. Yes. The sheep fold or hold? Fold. Fold, like they're folding a towel. Well, the sheep fold, fold is where the sheep are kept. They're out in the field in the day. They're brought to the sheep fold at night, and it's their home. They, they put, They're home. They put them in bed in a at night. Yeah. Put them to bed at night. Put them to bed at night. <laughs> okay. The Lord's going to put us to bed in his sheepfold. But there won't be any night. There won't be any day. And nothing's going to break you. Okay. okay. It's actually on the next one, too. The, Marcus, the whole thing is on that. Yeah. Right. Sheepfold. Right. Right. We'll go sheepfold. on and we'll see that. Yes. Okay. Now, notice one other thing about cancer. Okay. The head of the serpent... Hydra. We haven't talked about Hydra yet. We're going to, but you can see the yucky face of the serpent there. Right under the foot or the claw or whatever you want to call it of the crab. Okay? Under. Remember when we're crushed under foot, we're dead? Hydra is going to be a picture of Satan again, of Satan. And the crab is over, or the beetle is over. The foot is over. Hydra is going to be crushed under under foot. This is why the saints can rest forever because Satan, Satan, Satan is going to be done away forever. Never to come back. I love it. Okay, let's look at what's under the constellations under our, our um, I'm going to call it the beetle, <laughs> under our scarab, okay? We're going to see Ursa Minor. That means we're going to see it some major, and if I remember right, I'm looking real fast, I think the last one is Draco. No, it's Argo. We won't see Draco yet. Argo. Okay, we're going to see Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, and Ar Ar Argo. Okay, let me get my chart again. Roger's pulling it up on there, if you can see there. But, um, okay, the Argo, the ship's easy to see because it's the one way out here. Um, but I'm looking for Ursa Minor and Ursa Major, and I had them last night. Um, but from 11. Do you have them? Did you find them? From 11. Right there we go. There we go. Yeah, they are the ones that I was looking at. Look for the number 11 on your chart, and then look inside, and you see, again, they're, they're looking like animals. You see a big and a little. That's Ursa Minor, Ursa Major that we're going to talk about. Then go, go to like 5 o'clock on a, a clock. And at the, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm dyslexic. <laughs> Go to like 7 o'clock, okay? That would be like the 7. You'll find Argo, the ship, on the outside. 11, go to 7. Go, go, like if you were looking, if this was a clock, it would be 7 o'clock. Look here. Look right, right here. Right the right yeah, then, then look here. See, look here. That's Argo. Right down. The That's Argo. Those are the three we're going to talk about. Archer? Um, Right at Kids Major. 
It's, it's just, look at the last one over here, right here on your chart. Yeah, you've got your... And it looks like a ship? Yes, it looks oh. like a ship. That's what I'm talking oh, about. Right okay, but I don't think we'll get to the ship today. We're going to oh, start okay. with Ursa Minor. That's, in English, the little bear. And then Ursa Major will be the big bear, okay? Um, the name in uh, our ancient Hebrew, it's Zion or Zion, Katan, okay? And... Sion is related to the word Zion. It's a little bit off of it. It's hard to even hear the difference in my mouth, but it, it's meaning sheep, okay? So Ursa Minor from the Hebrew, even though it's called the little bear in our English, in the Hebrew, we get the idea of sheep and being the minor, they call it the lesser sheepfold, okay? And I have to stand corrected because I gave you guys a little dipper and a big dipper before, and I was wrong. So all I said about Little Dipper and Big Dipper in, in the dog signs, oops, I'm sorry, I got confused because here's your Little Dipper and your Big Dipper. Sorry about that. See, I'm very human and this is a lot for me to comprehend you know, in my study, sorry. Okay, so Little Dipper and Big Dipper belong in Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, not in Canis Major and Canis Minor. Um, is a bear on here? Well, that's what we're looking at now. They're we're calling that a bear. Oh, that's supposed to be a bear. That's supposed to be a bear. <laughs> Doesn't look like a bear to me. And originally, it it's wouldn't like have a been cat. a bear. It looks more like a cat, a yeah. Black cat. Originally, it would not this. have been a bear they because it, it has like a, a panther. panther. Okay. Originally, it has the tail. A bear doesn't have a tail. Okay, so panther is better. Pound. You're right. Panther is better. Okay. Bears don't have these long tails. The bear is not found in the Chaldean, the Egyptian, the Persian, or the Indian zodiacs. They do not call it the name that, that we get bear out of. Um, again, really, I think the panther is a good substitute. Okay? It doesn't, it doesn't say. But in this one now, at Ursa Minor, the polar star, remember we've talked about it, is, is the fixed star. It, the, the heavens are moving around it, but we found out it's actually moving so slowly. It took thousands of years for us to see where it has moved. Well, the polar star, the center star for the heavens, around which all the others are revolving, was, in, or it, yeah, is in the tip of this tail. And um, that was, it, that wouldn't have been, again, it can't be a bear because it just doesn't have the tail, the tail shows this polar yeah, star, okay? We do know from ancient times there were two constellations. There were a pair, okay? One was bigger or greater, one was smaller. The clue to what we're going to call them and what we're going to see in them, again, we want to look at the star names to help us get what we want to get out of it. So, one of the first names, the brightest star in the larger constellation, the greater whatever we're going to call it, the, the name in Hebrew means a fold. Again, we're seeing that sheepfold, we're seeing it relate to cancer, it's a sign that it's under. And the Hebrew word for this fold means also rest and security. So it would be like us saying today we're safe at home, you're safe in the fold. The fold is Yeshua's home, okay? The Arabic name for the, that star means a herd of animals. Well, where do you find a herd of animals? You'll find them, you know, fenced in. You'll find them in a safe place. You know, they're kept safely. That's what is the picture of. So, the dipper part would be the sheepfold, and the handle shows the way that the sheep were led to come into the fold, okay, is how they're looking at it. So I'm just, I'm going to call it the sheepfold because that just fits it all the better. It goes along again with that. Um, some say go back to Issachar and call it a donkey, but it doesn't look like a donkey to me either. Again, where the, the pictures are the human part of our study. Is this the lesser or, or, or the minor? Um, when we talked about just now the, the names that were in... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. We are still in the, the Ursa Minor. We are still in it. So the smaller one. But the brightest star in the smallest one means fold, means security, means rest. Yeah. Yeah, the sheepfold. Okay? If we look at this as two sheepfolds, 
a bigger one and a smaller one, but two sheepfolds, and that's how I see this very much. Then we are looking at Israel, and we're looking at the body of Christ, the church. You know, we're seeing the two. Because we know the Lord even said, I have other sheep of which you know nothing. He said that to the people of Israel. He was referring to who he would build into his whole body, the called out assembly. We call it the church today. So very easily, these two sheepfolds, very easily. One could be a picture of Israel and one could be a picture of the church. Very easily. The, no problem seeing that. So the lesser bears the church and the other one's the... Could be. The could be either center. way. Either way. Either way, it would it would fit. Um, the the redeemed flocks find safety and security. Israel will find that on earth in the millennium. The church finds it when we're raptured and taken home to heaven, our heavenly home. Okay. Now, some like to say it speaks of Israel and Judah when they were two different kingdoms, but those two become one in the hand of Messiah. So I don't see it as much that, although I guess you could argue it, the church and, and Israel come together, the one new man. So, you know, again, it's however you want to look at it. But let me give you how we know uh, Israel's security also. Ezekiel, that's Hezekiel in Hebrew, Ezekiel 34, verses 12 to 14. As a shepherd cares for his flock on a day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and a gloomy day. I will bring them out of, from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture. Their grazing place will be on the mountainous heights of Israel. There they will lie down in a good grazing place and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. Did I just read to you a sheepfold of safety bringing the, the uh, Jewish people from the four corners of the earth? These would be the, the remnant, the believing ones, brought into Israel in the millennium. Yes, that's Ezekiel 34 is prophesying that. Another prophet that gave that is Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. We're going to look at verse 3 first and then three and four, and then we're going to drop down to 10. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, verse three. The Lord appeared in long ago saying, I have left you with an everlasting love. When does that love end? Never. Everlasting means everlasting. God speaking to Israel. He didn't say when you're good, when you remain good, when you're obedient. He says, I love you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've drawn you out with kindness. I will build you again. You will be rebuilt, virgin of Israel. You will take up tambourines again and go out to the dances of the revelers. And verse 10 of that same chapter, Hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Declare it in the coastlands far away and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him. He will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. So yes, Israel, you've gone out in the diaspora. You are scattered throughout the nations. That's why you can find Chinese Jews and Korean Jews and Italian Jews and, and Sephardic Jews and you know, they're everywhere because they've been scattered out of their disobedience. God allowed them and even sent them out to be scattered. But the day is coming when he will draw those who hear him, the sheep, the sheep know their shepherd. When they hear him, he will call them back into the safety of the fold in this case he is talking millennial kingdom Israel. All those promises of the land are fulfilled in the millennium. That's what he's promising. So there's our promises for Israel being one of the sheepfolds. And then I take very much from Yochanan John 10. We talked about it last week. The good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. We saw that he resurrects. He gives his sheep abundant life. And he is the chief shepherd coming in his glory. He's ruling and reigning. I see us with him in that because he's given us that abundant new life. We, like the scarab, throw off that outer old shell. We come into the freedom that we are in, in the heavens. We are not bound to the earth. We have the spiritual heavenly promises. We come back with our chief shepherd to rule and reign over the earthly nations where Israel is the head nation. There's our two folds. We've got our heavenly fold. We've got our earthly fold. 
So for me, I see Israel and I see the called out assembly called the church. Um, the name bear might have come off of the Hebrew word because dov, and I told you dova was one of the words, or if I didn't know, the heart, I'm sorry. They're very close in Hebrew anyway because remember there's no vowels, so we're just looking at consonants. If one comes off the other, one means sheepfold and the rest secure, and the other means bear, okay, like a teddy bear. Those of you who remember um, my adopted son, Dov, was the Hebrew name he had, because they said he's <laughs> He's my teddy bear, not my dog, but my dog. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Shadow. Shadow. Tony's not the bear. Okay, Shadow. Okay, Shadow. He, he's the guard over the sheepfold. That's she is, I'm sorry. <laughs> she is. Okay. It's a dumb, yeah, reward her, Roger. She's just protecting us. <laughs> sorry, folks. Tony came in. He's a, he's welcome in. Um, shadow, shh. It's okay. We'll get Tony settled. Okay, and we'll keep going because really we're, we're supposed to be done. I just want to finish up this real quick, and I'll even repeat this next week because it's so important. I don't want us to miss it. The stars in the, this lesser sheepfold, the brightest and the most important in all the heavens is that polar star. al Rakuba in his original, uh, one of the older languages, means the turn or the ridden on. That's the polar star. It's like everything else turns or rides on that. It doesn't revolve in a circle as all the other stars do. It apparently appears fixed, even though it's slightly moving, it appears fixed, okay? Now, I told you this once before, I'll tell you it now, and we'll start when our minds are fresh and not fried. We'll start with it next week, so you'll hear it a third time to, to really catch hold. But when the constellations were formed, Draco the dragon had this polar star, it's also called Thuban, which means the subtle one. It had its, it was in Draco the dragon. Draco the dragon is safe, okay? It's a picture of Satan. Now, al Rakuba, all that, these are all the names for this star, okay? Um, 5,000 years ago, in Draco the dragon, you had that star, okay? Now, the heavens are moving very slowly. They're steadily moving. The central point is now shifted. Where it was in Hydra, now it's in the sheepfold, okay? It's in the lesser sheepfold. That's the little one. There it is, the North Star, Polaris, or however we say it, okay? It's taken almost 6,000 years to get from Hydra to the, the little, what do we call it? The lesser sheepfold. Okay, now, how could the stars know if God is not orchestrating this, that the one called the prince of the power of the air, Hydra is a picture of Satan, he has control until he is put under the feet of the Messiah who rules and reigns. This sign in the lesser sheepfold is reminding us that the shepherd has brought his sheep in safely that's his second coming. The fact that this major star that, that they still navigate by today has moved into the sign that belongs to the shepherd who's keeping his sheep safe tells us how close we must be on God's time scale to the second coming of Messiah. Is that not interesting? Is that not a good point to end on? I'll expound just a little bit longer on that next week, but I'm going to stop it right there and just let just let your mind absorb as much of this as you can. Let the wows out. Let the amazing, God's perfect timing. Remember he said that the sun came the first time in the time that was um, prescribed. Wrong way to say it. In the fullness of time is how the scripture says that it puts it well. That in the fullness of time, Messiah came in his first coming. What I'm showing you in the fullness of time, God has a time set. We are on God's time clock. I love to say, and I did a whole message on it, tick-tock, God's clock. 
on God's clock, we are seeing the time lining up that shows the shepherd ruling and reigning and the sheep safe in the fold. That's where we're at. Are you listening for the sounds? Quit looking for the signs. Yeah, Pam's saying, hurry up, Lord, hurry up. Quit looking for the signs. They're fulfilled. Listen for the sounds. We're going, he's coming. Yes. So that means that he started in, in the in, in the middle, the circle, pretty much, and now he's on the outside of the circle. The po the polar star started there, yes, and the polar star has moved slowly, so that it now it is there, yes. Do I understand how it does that, and how other stars move at a different pace? How we have our comets come in two different directions to form a cross, right in the point where it's speaking of the giant who falls, and that's where we see David threw the rock at Goliath and rocked him to sleep. No, I don't understand it for a moment, but I'm loving it. I'm fascinated by it. I'm shouting out. <laughs> I need a better word than wow. Give me something, somebody. It's so magnificent, so amazing, so awe-inspiring. My God is so indescribable. There we go, yes, yes. indescribable. That's my second favorite word. And that makes me think of Luli Giglioli, or however you say his name. If you've not, Google him. If you haven't, get anywhere close to spelling his name, you'll find him. The stuff he tells about our, our heavens and all of that, the way he, he opens up the, the mind scientifically, and he does it simple enough for a child to understand. You can literally buy a child's book I bought it for a child, I'm turning around and I'm buying my own <laughs> because I'm learning so much about God's scientific creation from this one who explains it on like a six to eight year old level. I love it. I'll take it. That's where I live. <laughs> but anyway, this is our God. Indescribable, unfathomable. Okay, all those big words, timing perfect. He keeps his word. He will keep us safe in salvation when we've opened our hearts to him. He'll take us home safely. He is going to return and rule to fulfill the promises to Israel. It is all, as God saw it, done and fulfilled. We see it unfolding. Abraham looked and saw the day of the Lord and was safe. He also was shown all the way to the second coming, all the way to what we will call eternity future. And that's where I think the heavens have been rolled up and God's going to roll out a new chart or a new roadmap. Are the heavens still exploding with birth? Yes, they are. They are. The Milky Way is still growing. That's why we can't even number. But you know what? Jeremiah 31 said that. It said we'd never be able to measure the heavens. And I laugh because every time science says, oh, we've got it, somebody discovers something Don't you just love him? Isn't he just mind-blowing? This, this shows me how great our God is. And I'll tell you honestly and very frankly, I would not want a God I could understand. Lord, help this world if it's all down on my level. <laughs> it needs the powerful hand of an awesome God who has a plan through the ages that nothing can derail. Man thinks he makes his plan and God laughs. He's only playing into the hand of God. We have an awesome God. Let's close in prayer. Hallelujah. Praise to you, O Lord our God. You are amazing and awesome. You are ineffable. You are omniscient and omnipresent and omnipowerful. You are mind-blowing to our finite minds. We cannot wait till we can slip off the finite and become infinite, that we can go from being that scarab beetle crawling on the ground, confined and lowly, to being able to soar the heavens and see how the heavens really declare your glory. Oh, Lord, thank you for giving us a glimpse. We are so excited just over this glimpse that we can begin to contain and we know the glories are yet to come. The eye has not seen and ear has not heard what you have prepared for those who love you. Well, Lord, we do love you. And we can't wait to be with you. And if anyone is not in that group yet, yeah, Lord, we pray that right now they'll just open their hearts to you. That they can have you as Savior and Lord in their lives now. And thank you that you are in the minutest split second details of our lives now. And thank you that that means we have, when we leave this earth, 
we go home to be with you forever, that we will be in the sheepfold. We will be safe. You are our shepherd. We are your sheep. Hallelujah. Praise you. Thank you. Hallelujah again. In your name. Oh, me. And amen. amen. Sorry, I'm just out of words. Laugh at me all you want, but <laughs> what a God we have. Open up the mics, Roger, and let someone else shout it out. <laughs>